Does a man's moral failure mean he's a lie? Can you say that with me? Now you're saying, what do I mean by moral? Uh, we're going to define that as the sermon proceeds. You have heard it. I hear it. You hear it by the grapevine, second, third, fourth, fifth hand. A man fails at something somewhere in his life. His business, his marriage, finances, a broken promise. You know, maybe the man has a hidden addiction. Even worse, what society deems a character flaw. And what is the response we too often hear? He's a lie. The man's a lie. And the implication is this. Because a man fails at something, you can join me, or isn't what we thought he was, he is a lie, and everything about him should now be discarded as worthless. Granted, every one of us would love to be Job. When God spoke of Job, he said he is a blameless man without thought. But don't you find it interesting that when he lost everything, and hear me, when I say everything, I mean everything. There wasn't a single thing left in his life. You say, oh yes, there was. It was his wife. One in marriage plus one equals what? One. You want to try that again? In marriage, one plus one equals one. So when we say Job lost everything, he did. Because Job was one flesh with his wife, therefore he didn't lose himself. Everything is gone. And here's what's strange about this man that God said was perfect and blameless. All of a sudden, his friends found a million things that he had done wrong with equally as many character flaws. They didn't say a thing about Job when he was successful. Not a thing. But the moment his success slipped from him and he appeared to be sliding downhill... They pounced on him like wolves pounce on a wounded deer. May I suggest, don't be a loser. Can you say that with me? Don't be a loser. Balcony, join us. Don't be a loser. Who or what is a loser? Here's a loser. A loser is someone, read it with me, who needs to justify another person's misfortune. And I guess by doing so, his friends felt like they were elevating themselves by putting him down. But it's not God's way, nor is it the instruction we find in the Word of God. God says just the opposite. He doesn't say, pounce on your friend's when they're down. Pounce on the one whom you thought was one thing, and for whatever the reason is, you don't understand, they appear to be something else. No, this is what God tells us. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Read this with me. But only what is useful or helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now, Job's friends may have meant well, and I really believe they were friends. First of all, they travel from all over the country, and they come to Job, and when they see him, they are totally dumbfounded. They cannot believe what they see. This man, who was the wealthiest man in the East, has lost everything. He's sitting literally in an ash heap 
scraping himself with pottery. And they don't say a word for seven days. Not a single word. That's a friend. They rend their garments. They put ashes on their heads. And they mourn because they don't understand what has happened. They are befuddled. However, when they do open their mouths, they open their mouths without knowledge because they don't understand what has happened. So the moment they begin to open their mouths, they criticize Job. Because this doesn't make sense. They're saying to themselves, how can this man be whom we thought he was and this happened to him? Therefore, Job has to be a lie. Job, your whole life is alive. And they went on a discourse from that point on, pointing out everything in Job's life that they thought he had done wrong, even attacked his character. And God had to intervene. Because here's the problem. God saw what his four friends did not see. And what was that? Starts with an H, ends with a T. His heart. We're so quick to judge a man's misfortune and put it in the light of the world in which we live and never see it in the light of the world in which God lives. So God saw his heart, his friends not understanding, spoke without knowledge. And God says this, look at it. Chapter 42 Last chapter in the book of Job, page 609 in your prayer ministries edition, and page 818 if you have a life application Bible. He says this, after the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Now actually, there are four friends who are there, but God never addresses Eliphaz. He's the youngest. He's the one that keeps his mouth shut, lets all the old people speak first. And then he decides he knows more than everybody else. And he opens his big mouth. And when God addresses Job's friends, he doesn't even count him in. Like, who's this guy? Shut up. It's modern day English. Now note that if God who says the accusations against Job were an affront, they don't say it's an affront to Job. He says they were an affront to God. Why? Because they didn't understand the ways of God. Because God's ways are not our ways and God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Think on this for a moment. I'm going to give you a few examples. Does it seem right to depose a woman of character and replace her with another? Does it? No. And yet, that's exactly what God does. In the book of Esther, God deposes Vashti, a woman of nobility, character, and if the word God was used in the book, by the way, it's never used in the entire book of Esther. If it were used, I suspect God would say she was a noble and godly woman. And yet he disposes her, or displaces is probably a better word, for another woman of character, Esther. Now here's still another. King David had ten wives. Yet the Messiah comes from the woman he stole from another man through an act of adultery. And by the way, the Bible never tells us that Bathsheba in any way refused the king. She could have. Vashti refused the king. All Xerxes wanted was to bring his beautiful bride before a bunch of drunken nobles and lords and display her beauty. And she said to her hubby, ain't no way I'm going before those sloshed men. And like that, she was deposed. Bathsheba could have said no. 
She doesn't. And yet, God brings the Messiah from Bathsheba, not any of the other nine wives that David is married to. Legitimate wives, if you please. What am I saying? I'm saying that God's ways are not our ways, and God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Here's still another. Tamar. In disguise, prostitutes herself to her father-in-law. Now, did you get that? Her father-in-law. And from that act of prostitution, we get the Messiah. Now, that's a great story. In fact, George, you'll remember, because we were in the uh, Pittman Bassani Club building. It was the second Mother's Day. And I preached on this very text, Tamar. And the text was, God justifies a woman. I need to do it again. It is a great sermon. I don't have time to develop the narrative. So again, here's my point. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Back to Job. So he says, now take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. I was telling somebody last night, I, I'm reading Job again, and it's interesting, but I never thought about Job as being allegorical. I always thought this was a literal man and literal events, and I suspect that it is. Just like the Song of Solomon. Solomon, he has a bride. She's uh, Egyptian, a little darker than most of those brides that surrounded him, and uh, takes her to wife. But just as literal as it is, it is allegorical. And I think the same is true of Job. I never saw it this way before. But the next time read Job, read it as a parable. Just look at all the numbers. The sheep, how it was 5,000, which represents grace, and 3,000, which represents perfection. And you just walk through all these numbers. And then think of this. He says, I want your friends to offer seven bulls and seven rams. Now, why seven? Because seven is God's number of completion. And the church said, no, just, I'm with you, pastor. And the church said, I'm with you, pastor. So he says, seven bulls and seven rams. Now, the bull was a sin offering, and the ram was a guilt offering. By the way, they were mandatory. You didn't have an option. So God is demanding that Job's friends offer a guilt offering and a sin offering. Let's look at it. Stand with me. We'll read it together. Take a deep breath. Pinch your neighbor. Make sure they're awake. Say, this isn't too heavy. I didn't hear you say that. Is it really that heavy? Are you with me? Fran, are you with me? Guys with me? All right. All right. My servant Job will pray for you. Whose prayer is he going to accept? The friends? No, what's the next word? And I will accept his prayer. Not yours, because you guys didn't get it right. But I'm going to accept his prayer in your behalf. And I won't deal with you according to your stupidity. Isn't that what it says? Yeah, you're there judging your friend, sitting there for seven days, calling him every name under the book, telling him he's a scumbag. You know, just read it. Friends like he, that he had, you wouldn't need enemies. That's not true. They were really friends. They just didn't understand it, just like a lot of things in life we don't understand. So don't go shooting your mouth off on things you don't understand. Where's my amen, Bob? All right. You have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Nemathite, wasn't too bad, did what the Lord told them and the Lord accepted whose prayer? Job's prayer. 
two truths worthy of our attention in these eight personalities. Unless we add all of Job's four friends, then we've got 11. Now here's the personalities we've looked at, directly or indirectly. Queen Vashti, King Xerxes, King David, Bathsheba, Tamar, Judah, who was her father-in-law that she prostituted herself to. We could throw Esther in there as well. Job and his four friends. Now here are the truths. Number one, because a person comes upon a misfortune doesn't mean they have done wrong in the eyes of God. Write that down. Because a person comes upon a misfortune doesn't mean they've done wrong in the eyes of God. Maybe in the eyes of people, but not in the eyes of God. And that's what happened in the situation or the case with Job. And I'm sure that if we judged Tamar and Vashti and Esther and the rest of them, we would come up with a conclusion similar to this. Secondly, because a person experiences what God calls a sin and society deems a failure, doesn't mean that man or woman is a lie. Father, that you would let us understand your ways, lay hold of your heart, Strengthen the weak, bind up the bruised and broken, put healing in the bodies of the sick, bring home those who have strayed, and save the lost in Jesus' name. The church said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to give you some examples quickly. Many people in our society would say Jim Swagger, Jimmy Swagger, and Jim Baker are a lie because of their moral failures. I wonder how God would summarize their lives. Some would say that Amy Simple McPherson, the famous evangelist and founder of the, founder of the Four Square Church, was a lie because of her three marriages, two divorces, and alleged affairs, none of which, by the way, were proven true. Do you realize that when she died, now we're talking about the 40s, 45,000 thousand people attended her funeral 45,000 they stood in line to up to 2 a.m. in the morning so not everybody agreed with her critics however I think the real question is I wonder how God would summarize Amy's life some would say that Thomas Jefferson the principal author of the Declaration of Independence the third president of the United States was a lie Because he expressed opposition to slavery while still owning them. Still others say he fathered an illegitimate child by a slave woman. Yet Americans then and today are the beneficiaries of his tenets of government. And many assert that Thomas Jefferson is one of America's greatest presidents. But the real question is, how would God summarize Thomas Jefferson's life? And I could mention other people of prominence and recognition in my own lifetime. President Nixon, John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., all of whom are said to have had personal stains upon their lives. What is true? What is false? Do we really know? But even if it were true, or even if it were false, does it make that person a lie. Let's walk through the Bible for a moment and see if a person's failure makes him or her a lie. Now listen to what I just said. We're going to walk through the Bible and when I'm done, I want you to say to me, that person's failure made them a lie or that person's failure did not make them a lie. Moses was a murderer. Jacob was a liar. Did that mean he was a lie? 
Rahab earned a living as a prostitute. Samson was a womanizer. Elijah wanted to commit suicide. Jonah refused to deliver God's message. Solomon worshipped foreign gods. Nebuchadnezzar oppressed the poor. Esther took the place of a noble and possibly godly queen with no second thoughts. Zacchaeus was a thief. Mary Magdalene was a wicked, godless woman with seven demons. And the Apostle Paul persecuted Christians, watching them die cruel deaths. And yet, God used every person I just mentioned to accomplish great things for him. And the church said, hallelujah. Now, were they perfect? Did their lives have issues which society then and now would consider wrong and in need of correcting? Yes. Some would say that these men and women had serious character flaws. Did that make their lives a lie? No. Every person that I have mentioned, both from the Bible and from history, has changed the world for the better. Now, don't get me wrong. The purpose of this sermon isn't to give you or me a license to sin. We all know there's no benefit or advantage in continuing in our sin. And the church said, amen. The price is pretty heavy. My purpose is to make us realize that, read this with me, if we struggle with a sin... It doesn't mean we are a lie or our lives are useless. In fact, it's in persevering that we achieve victory. So I want to encourage you with this. If you allow the devil to tell you that because you have failed somewhere along the line or are presently failing then you have bought the lie and he has rendered you powerless to accomplish anything for God. If Satan can say to you, you're a lie and you believe that, then right where you are, you have been petrified and God can't use you to accomplish anything at any time, anywhere. I'm serious. You know how many stories I hear? A guy's sitting on a bar stool in Clancy's or somewhere, and he's backslidden and far from God, and a believer comes in and sits next to him, and they start talking about God, and both of them get convicted, and they come back to church and turn their lives around. If you're a believer, you are absolutely never useless in the kingdom unless you believe Satan and allow yourself to be immobilized right where you are. Don't let him do that. And don't let any person in the church do it either. And the church said, amen. amen. However, there's a remedy. We have to be like the publican on Solomon's portico. You remember, Jesus called his disciples to himself. And there was... Um, the disciples, and there was this Pharisee who was boasting about himself, how he was righteous and he wasn't like other people, and he gave his tithe and he went to church and you know he worked in the church and he did everything that appeared to be right. But he never admitted at any time that he had his own personal flaws, that he had his own troubles and his issues. He was just thinking he was Mr. Perfect. There was another man who stood on Solomon's portico and he cried out to God, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said to his 12, so tell me, who went away justified? And they wisely responded, the man who said, be merciful to me, a sinner. If we're willing to start there, then God will take care the rest. Proverbs 24, 16 tells us this. Read it with me. No matter how many times you trip them up, God loyal people don't stay down long. Soon they're up on their feet while the wicked end up flat on their faces. 
So let me close with a story that's found in On This Day, which can be purchased in the bookstore. I close every night with this, uh, this year, as my devotions. Alexander Cruden was born in Scotland on May 31st, 1699. His father was a strict Puritan and forbade that they play games on the Lord's Day. Do you know my grandmother? She didn't cook on Sunday. She would cook on Saturday, but she wouldn't cook on Sunday because in her mind that was working because she did that six days a week. So she didn't cook on Sunday. She would only cook on Saturday. And that was in the, you know, 1900s. This is back in the 1600s. So, so the kids, if your dad's let you go out, play games, play ball, soccer, whatever, you didn't have that privilege if you were living back in the 1700s. It was the Lord's Day. It was a day of rest. You didn't play games. So Alexander had to figure out a way to entertain himself. So what he did was he would trace words in the Bible. And he enrolled in college at the age of 13. Not high school, college at the age of 13. That's what happens when you have to stay home on Sundays and trace words in the Bible. Put you in college at the age of 13. So at 13, he's in college. At 19, he graduates. But he fell in love. And that messes a lot of people up. <laughs> Messed him up. The girl's father forbade him in the house. And when she became pregnant, she was sent away. Typical of that culture. Today we nurture. We make sure the baby's taken care of. And the home is a place where God dwells. In those days, you got pregnant, you were gone. Well, Alexander, his nerves shattered, entered an asylum. Alexander fell in love again, was rejected again, and went to such extremes to attract the woman's affection that he was seized, taken to a private asylum, and chained to a bed for ten weeks. He finally managed to escape by cutting off the bed leg. And then he began traveling around, calling himself Alexander the Corrector. He felt God had called him to correct the immoralities of his day. And so one guy was cursing. He picked up a shovel and hit him over the head. Put him into an asylum again for the third time. People thought he was crazy. <laughs> and today, we would probably think he was crazy. But we would have some sort of psychological you know, evaluation, we'd have him on something that would in some way or another stable his instabilities. But this half-crazed man gave Christians for many generations crudence, concordance. Spurgeon writes this in the flyleaf of his Bible. For 10 years, this crudence, uh, concordance, crudence, concordance, has been at my left hand when the word of God has been at my right. This half-crazed Cruden did better service to the church than half the DDs and LLDs of all time. I wonder how God would summarize Cruden's life. You know, I wonder how God would summarize David's life. Because you know how people summarize David's life. The moment we summarize David's life, what do we think? We say, oh, he was an adulterer and a murderer, and he was prideful because he counted men and cost Israel 70,000 lives. He was a lie. That's now how God summarized his life. God said he was a man after his own heart, and he shepherded Israel with integrity tenderness of heart. I want to encourage you. Those of you who have had setbacks in life. Things that people have called moral failures, character flaws, whatever they may be. And men, we probably get it in a little different way 
than the ladies. I believe that's why God has given me this sermon for Father's Day. Only God knows your heart. Amen. Only God knows your heart. Don't be discouraged. Persevere. That's where the victory comes. And I suspect when it's all said and done, if you will persevere and when you've failed, you'll get up. That when you stand before him, he will say of you, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. And the church said, Amen. Father, uh, a little strange text for Father's Day, but I know that this word was from you and not from Bruce. And so I pray that it would be an encouragement to every man who is present, every person who is present, to know that because of our own failures, it does not make us a lie in your sight. And that in your sight, even in the midst of our setbacks and failures, you can accomplish great things for your name's sake and to your glory. Now you say, Pastor, how in the world do I enter in? How do I have a relationship with a God who is going to turn my messes into something good, my ashes into something beautiful? Begin with a relationship with him. Pray a prayer something like this. Say, Father in heaven, just say this to yourself. Father in heaven, thank you for loving me. Forgive me for the things I've done that are wrong. I am sorry. I acknowledge to you that I am a sinner. Forgive me. Jesus, come into my heart. Take my life from this moment on. Let me be your disciple. And may others see you and me. In Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. church said, Amen. Amen.